Michael Jackson too. Talk about many tours with Michael. One of the greatest, biggest tours. I, I'm not sure. That's with Sugar Food Moffat, correct? Yeah, and, and yeah. Jonathan was playing. And get this, Jonathan, he knocked on my door and he brought in a, a big book of all his pictures playing with the Jackson family. And he auditioned himself to me and I'm going, how in the hell do I have credentials? You're playing with Michael Jackson. Well, it turns out, word gets around when you've worked with Frank Zappa and you go through that boot camp, you have credentials. Welcome to Kirky B on DC. And I am here with two of the most, I would say they're at the top of my famous duos list. And if I may, I want to, before I introduce who they are, I want to go down my list of these famous duos. And it starts off like this. Laurel and Hardy, Sonny and Cher, Martin and Lewis, Abbott and Costello, Ashford and Simpson, Penn and Teller, <laughs> the Blues Brothers, Sam and Dave, Elton John and Bernie Toppin, Cheech and Chong, Lennon and McCartney, Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers, Bob Hope and Bing Crosby, Simon and Garfunkel, Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall, Hall and Oates, Tom and Jerry, Rogers and Hammerstein, Jack Lemmon and Walter Matthau, but my two top guys are the one and only Don Lombardi and John Good. Whoa. Ladies and gentlemen, Don and John. What did you think of that list, John? Pretty impressive, huh? He, uh, he left out who you and I refer ourselves to as Bartles and James. Yeah, that's true. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're on there as uh, honorary. But you guys are definitely at the top of that list for me. Thank I, you. Thank you, Kurt. You guys are, you know... You guys are family, and there's hundreds of people that would love to be doing what I'm doing right now at this moment to be able uh, to ask you guys questions. So I'm I'm so honored. Well, we have, at the end of the show, we have a little surprise for everybody too. John and I have been talking about. We'll, we'll clue them in at the end. Great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It'll be fun. So I'm going to start off with just a simple question to both of you. How have you guys been doing since this whole pandemic? We're approaching a year's time now, and uh, John, how have you been dealing with all of this? Well, you know, and when this thing started, thank you. Uh, I was in Detroit on my way to Milan, Italy. And uh, and Don was going, no, 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 you're not. And I said, well, you know, and I'm determined to go find wood and veneer and exotic things because that's the engine of what we do at DW Drums. And he said, just, just reconsider. Don't do that. Well, Esther and I are in Dearborn, Michigan, and then I went, oh, okay, I mean, I get it. So I said, how about Germany? Well, Germany was still open at the time, and it, it occurred to us, yes, we can get there. And some of these places are still open because a lot of people denied, as I, I hate to say it, I did as well, the severity of what was about to hit us. And um, what's, what's horrible is that, yes, you could get overseas, but – Coming back would be a B I T C H. Um, they at that time they wanted you to be quarantined at a Air Force base, and oh. as Don well knows very well, I don't do well in barracks and and uh, in quarantine and quarantine. <laughs> <laughs> so anyone does. So no, no one does. But we came back, and um, it's been very strange, Kurt. I had some health issues that. That kind of coincided with the whole thing. So it was actually good that I could um, lay out for a little while. And, uh, you know, I had some issues, some, some, some surgeries I had to go through. But, but I will tell you that now that that's over and most of last year is over, I feel like, um, I don't know, I feel new again. I mean, we can't do all the things we used to do, but. You know, seeing Don from time to time, we're still all very under under the radar as far as going in and um, being able to do the, the everyday things that we like to do. But that spawns a lot of creativity. And um, I'm working on our 50th anniversary right now, and that's how I'm dealing with some of the isolation. 
And I go into the office five days a week uh, against Don's recommended thing, but I stay in my office for the most time. Kirky had an interesting comment. Uh, I don't know if it was on the earlier show you did with, with Matt or with uh, Eric Hernandez, but uh, you talked about uh, what happened just before the Roaring Twenties. Tell that story really quick, Kurt, because it was interesting. Oh, yeah. A buddy of mine, we were talking about this whole pandemic thing, and he was saying, you know, the Spanish flu was 1918. <clears throat> 1918, you know, a lot of people had perished. A lot of things had happened. Everyone was on lockdown. Kind of essentially what is going on now. But once it was over, after 1918, the next decade was the Roaring Twenties. So I think once this is all over, man, we're going to be creating music, buying new drums, cymbals, sticks, drum heads, starting new bands, making new music. I think it's going to be. It'll be the Roaring. It'll be the Roaring Twenties. It'll we're be the Roaring Twenties exactly. Again. So Don, same same question for you. What, what have you done this past year with this pandemic? Well, this is you know same same as. John, really, we've had to adapt to a new life, constantly thinking at the beginning it would be over in a couple months, so let's just wait. It'll be over in a couple months. Let's just wait. Uh, but um, before this happened, uh, I was in the middle of rebuilding the Drum Channel website, so kind of you don't have to be in, in the office to do that, so we are able to pursue that and get that done a little quicker than we had anticipated, uh, and that launched in October. So I've been really busy just kind of Wrapping that up and working on a little bit of bucket list things, which I'm finding that the bucket is getting closer to getting empty. So I better start getting everything <laughs> as quick as I can here. So I'm, I'm working on uh, kind of documenting all the lessons that Freddie Gruber gave me back at the beginning when I was one of his first students when he came to town here. Uh, and that'll be something I always wanted to have. So we, we can kind of have Drum Channel be a... Uh, uh, and that's what I've been working on, kind of a, a library, a vault of the best information that drummers can have. So it's just a lot of these guys have to be memorialized, as John and I are, are aware, and we've been doing that as much as we could. And so happy we were able to do it with Joe Morello and Louis Belson and Jimmy Cobb and guys who are, who are no longer with us. So. Let's go oh. way back in time. Oh, just a couple of years ago, when you guys first met. Don Lombardi, John Good, when you guys first met, what year, when was this happening, and where? I think you walked in the door at uh, Lincoln Boulevard, right? So it was Lincoln that? Boulevard. Uh, Kirky, have you ever been by that place? You know, someone pointed it out to me years and years ago, and I completely <laughs> forgot. It's Is it Lincoln and Ashland? Ashland. Yeah. And Ashland, okay. I know and, if I drove by there, I'd remember. And well, it's a, the, you know, you, it's a nail salon. So of course you're going to notice. <laughs> um, right. Anyway, uh, I walked in there because I was a frustrated drummer. I'd just gotten as far as I can get. And uh, I'd seen a little uh, listing for a drum workshop in the yellow pages. New, brand new. So I think this was late 73. And, um, or early 73, I forget. I think it was in January, Don. That's what I think I remember. Anyway, so I go in there, and I met Don Lombardi, and it was like about a, a place the size of Kirky. You've been to my office. It was about that big, you know, wow. and and it was cool because it was just like Mecca for he had a desk, which I think we still have. Somebody uses that desk. And a bunch of drumsticks and some drum heads and, and a drum set in, in a re rehearsal room. And we sat down and he said, uh, okay, let's, let's start off by showing me what you, what you have. So I sat down and you're I was, You were about 17, right? I was 17 years old. And moved and, and, uh, on your own to California. Let's go back a little bit before that. Let's talk about a gutsy guy. No, I got on a motorcycle from uh, the Dearborn, Michigan area. Wow. And uh, I told my dad, I said, look, man, I've, I've got to go to L.A. I don't know why, but I do. And I was living with, remember the Blocker family? I was yeah. living with, so I wanted to go out and see Dana Blocker. 
And uh, who he is, so people don't know, famous. Well, Dan, Dan Blocker was Haas on Bonanza, and we went to school together in Switzerland. I was wow. really, really lucky to have done some great things. I mean, well, well, Don was in the Air Force. I was, you know, uh, cruising around Europe as a favored son. Anyway, um, but I, I, I drove a motorcycle out, and this motorcycle broke down. <laughs> I think in Kearney, Nebraska, and they just filled it up full of thick. I didn't have any money. And uh, they said, here, here's a bunch of thick oil. Drive 35 miles an hour. And I drove from Nebraska to L.A. 35 miles an hour. Oh, my God. I got there and and I met Don through wanting to. to I thought I wanted to be a better drummer. And Don is used to teaching people who want to be better at what they, what they think they're going to do. I thought I was going to be a rock and roll drummer, man. I, I had these great aspirations and Don sat down and he looked at what I was doing and I was a stiff, you know, horrible, no technique whatsoever. <laughs> and, and he tried to just say, look, just turn your hand over. Let's start here. I tried to show him the, the way that I was taught how to do it. Exactly. I mean, which so is a jazz proper... teaching a rocker. I now, now the fourth, the fourth time, I the fourth lesson. At which point he came in. You were working at a plastics company, correct? Which was yeah, about plastic march or something like that. Yeah, and, and I was had... breathing in methyl ethyl ketone. They had me filling up these containers, and I was like, I don't know. I think I'm high as a kite. Dog. Well, he, would, he would come in for his lesson a little happier than the normal person. He just <laughs> a little half in the bag, as they say. Half in the bag. So by, the, by the time the fourth person came around, me showing him the exact same thing for the fourth time and saying, you're not doing it the way I'm showing you. And he said, I want to do it this way. I'm like, well, then why are we spending time? I think I was giving you a free lesson at that point because you had no money. So I, I had, had no money. No. Wow. No. And then and, and to, to be... To be quite honest, you had no money either. That's and <laughs> there, there were times, and, and Don, the, the beauty of the whole damn thing was like, that he and I would talk drums. And Don had this ingenious idea for these two cylinders that would go inside one another, which is an adjustable trap case seat, which became what he thought would be called the Royal Throne. <laughs> okay, let's take a look at a picture of that. I think we've got one. The adjustable trap. Oh, my our goodness. First, our first, uh, first product ever. Oh, yes. I made that. This is before we ever did drum. This is before we bought the Campco tooling dies and moles. I, I'm just noticing it was called The Drum Workshop. It was called The Drum Workshop. Well, because it was a teaching studio back at the yeah. time. The Drum Workshop where you would gotcha. come, to, where you would come to, 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 take, to take drum lessons. It had nothing to do with manufacturing. Well, in studying with Freddie Gruber, it was really important to balance yourself. The only real good seat back in those days was the Rogers throne. So pretty much everybody used the Rogers throne or the cylindrical seat. But I wanted to make one that would adjust, that would solve the problem, because I had a chance to sit behind Buddy's kit once when I was playing across the street in a show band in Vegas, and his was definitely not 24 inches. So obviously for those guys, they would make whatever they wanted. Um, Jumping ahead, I found out years later the reason they made it 24 inches is because they wanted to cut a piece of 4 by 8 plywood in half and not waste the other half of the plywood. <laughs> wow. That's the real reason. That, that was the truth. That was the so truth. During, so during this time, there were no drum sets made, just the, the royal. No, we just made the seat. And go go back to the image of the seat for a second. The the uh, the back the back flyer on it. So the so we wanted to have everything included in it. And I'll this this story comes up in just another minute, but. We had a cover that went over it. We had a stick bag that went inside. There was um, uh, levelers that went on it. And if you're working clubs, as I was in those days, it's dark at the end of the night and you can't find stuff. So I even <laughs> put a flashlight. Remember, John? A little pen light. Yeah. A little pen light flashlight that was in it. Yeah. Which not for long because it kept getting stolen when dealers would put these in their shop and they keep calling <laughs> another day we didn't send we say we did so but in our in our entire experience with john yeah there was one opportunity i think i can remember in our entire lives together where he absolutely i said can we do something because he would always come through and do everything there was one thing he said he would not do and that's that's uh included in that picture there when i thought hey john 
let's just have a, 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 a vinyl cover that would slip over the seat. Can you sew it for us? And you said? I don't sew. And, and I swear <laughs> to God, I thought at that time, okay, listen, I would, you know, I would go to, I'd crawl across glass for this guy because he kind of rescued me from trying to figure out what the heck I wanted to do in life. And I, I, I kind of realized I wasn't going to be a, a good drummer. And so I'd stay up and, and I still tried to rehearse and I'd have a little couple guys come in, but at night after, after hours, I'd build the, these thrones and Don was out beating the bushes in, I think it was in Gardena at some, some club he worked in. I was playing with a jazz trio at that point for five years at a, wow. at a club on, in Hollywood and then in Gardena, yeah. Yeah, then in Gardena. Anyway, so when he came up with this whole idea about now I'm going to be a seamstress, I just went, you, you know, I, I, I don't sew. I, I'm, not, I'm not going that far. <laughs> so I acknowledge, okay, one, th one thing you can't do, and we've, we've stuck to that pretty much through the years. So. Uh, and then there was, so, so now we have this product, which you're right, because the, the <laughs> this, this particular ad was put out in 1974. There got, it is, the royal throne. So that was something that I said, we have to come up with a name that everybody would remember uh, didn't have any marketing money, obviously. So now, it's it's hard to tell from the photo, but was well, that covered was, in fur or there was no modern drummer <laughs> in those days. This was pre modern drummer, I believe. Modern drummer came into existence. We'd have to look that up, but I think it was 77, 76. Okay. So the only place you would advertise was in the Musicians Union paper. I That's see. right. The National Musicians Union paper. So I put this ad in for $75. Thought it was an interesting idea, and to my amazement, which was a real business lesson for me in later life when we had the opportunity to really get into manufacturing business, I would get checks from people around the country, not a lot, but we'd get four or five or six a month with 75 bucks in it. They don't know me. I don't know them. Um, they're just trusting that if you have a good idea, whether you have a name or not, uh, it's something that you could you could sell, and that that wow. stuck in my mind throughout my whole opportunity of getting into um, making the pedals and drums with John. That even though we didn't have a brand name at the beginning, if you can solve a drummer's problem, you've got a chance for for success. So we did immediately. However, as soon as the ad came out, I got calls. First call was from Freddie Gruber. You remember his complaint, John? He said you got to change the name. Yeah, he said. You know what a royal throne really is? It's, it's a toilet, you know? So that had to change. <laughs> that was the end of, we changed it to the adjustable trap case seat immediately. Uh, wow. And then we put an ad in Modern Drummer, yet to be found. And uh, when Modern Drummer came out, it was the first ad we put out. So, you know, trying to put on a marketing hat, I thought drummers use this, right? Which is great for a drummer. But when guys were using it, uh, Nick Ciroli, my mentor and teacher for many years and dear friend, uh, was playing in the jazz trio with Chuck Berghofer and Dave Mackay. And he said, you know, Chuck would like one, the bass player. Because at the end of the night, he can put chords in it, his microphone and cables and stuff. And he likes to sit down when he's playing and stuff. So I thought, whoa, a light went on. Okay, let's do an ad. And let's say it's great for drummers, bass players. And what about keyboard players? They could, they, you know, they could use it too. So Absolutely. long story short, we do this ad for Modern Drummer and this is big bucks. I mean, it was a full page ad. We've never, this was, you know, this, 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 one, this one hurt. So I had a friend of mine who was an advertising agent and uh, we designed the ad. I got pictures of all three guys and I just called Nick up and I said, hey, the guy that's doing this ad for me wants quotes. So I said, what I'd like to talk about is that it's a really soft top. So it's comfortable to sit on. You can store your stuff on the inside. And we even has a light so you can find, you know, things on a dark stage. So I thought that would be great. So he talked to the guys and he said, yeah, just use it. Use whatever quote you want. They, you know, they don't care. They're happy to, they're happy to help out. <laughs> so, so I put those three quotes together and I sent, them, I sent them to the, sent them to my advertising agency friend. And I said, hey, well, these are the three quotes. Really soft, to, you know, really comfortable to sit on. I can play a gig for hours. That's really great. Um, I can put all my stuff on the inside and hey, I can, I can, I can find parts on a dark stage because it's got a flashlight. So 
I, I don't, in those days, you had to send an ad to Modern Drummer four months in advance, right? And wow. John and I are busy just trying to stay alive. So uh, I, he put the ad together and I said, mail it off to Modern Drummer. So he put it together, he mailed it off to Modern Drummer, everything was good. I'm then uh, at the house after the ad comes out, I get a call from Frank DeVito and he said, have you seen your ad in Modern Drummer? I said, uh, no, I haven't got mine yet, but it's, it's a full page ad. And he says, yeah, but Nick Ceroli says it's really comfortable and great to sit on. Chuck Berghofer says, hey, I can store all my stuff inside. Dave Mackay, again, I gave these three quotes to my advertising friend who doesn't know these people from Adam. Dave Mackay says, yeah, it's great. You can find parts on a, on a dark stage with a flashlight. So <laughs> problem is, as Kurt knows, Dave Mackay is blind. <laughs> well, that was one of the, whiz. So you learn lessons as you go that you, you've got to uh, double, double and triple check things and think them through. Fact check, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But that was our first product. That was it during the day. So that was a big deal. That was deal. a magic yeah. flashlight inside or something, you know? Yeah. So, well, wow. and Don, Don had all these ideas. Uh, I mean, excuse me, because we had these cardboard tubes. And um, one of the most fascinating things that I think you came up with, Don, uh, during that time, and I don't even know if you remember this, this is that he, we, we built a Tom Tom. Yeah. Using parts from wherever, I think it was Slingerland actually at the time, and and, um, and he had a little lever with a, a a baffle in the center that was quite ingenious. I remember that, yeah. That we never really did anything with. So, oh, and, ooh. Put that back on our list. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think Only we probably have about a thousand drummers now that are ready to buy this. It cut the yeah. size of the, it cut the, the reflection of the sound inside the tom and half. So it gave your sound a completely different tone. Wow. Color totally different. Right. Only, I want one. There, <laughs> right. We'll give it, we'll put that on our, our eternal R and D list. Right. We got it. So, so that, so that, that's an excellent jumping off point uh, for the next question. You know, when did you guys start deciding to make drums? Hey, Chad Smith here. I'm at the drum channel. Huh? Hi, I'm Don Lombardi. About 40 years ago, I started DW Drums in my garage. During that whole period of time, I was lucky to get to know many of the greatest drummers and teachers of all time. Drum Channel is a unique opportunity for you to invest in your future, and we have made sure that it's worth it. You know, when did you guys start deciding to make drums? At well, this point. So, you know, you have the, the royal throne and then at some point in between, I'm sure it was going through your mind of maybe we start well, making drums. How did that all come about? Well, sitting on the royal throne one day, I was thinking about. <laughs> <laughs> Which one? <laughs> the, uh, no, uh, what happened was uh, I was working. Uh, I had before starting uh, drum workshop as a teaching studio, I was running and continued to run 40, 50 students a week playing six nights a week, burning a candle kind of at both ends. And uh, the idea of starting drum workshop was consolidating my older students. So basically, um, Freddie Gruber, who I had studied with for many years, had kind of like um, worked with me a lot to perpetuate his method of teaching. Because I was about his first student when he moved out here. And, and he taught in a different way then than he did, you know, older students. But uh, he was, his reputation was growing and he wasn't really uh, the guy that you would want to start out learning how to play drums with or certainly wouldn't want to take younger students. So he would send me students uh, that either he didn't have room for or for sure if they were younger. Uh, so he was teaching, um, I believe it was Marty Pace's son, if I remember the story, and their next door neighbor was Tom Beckman, who had owned Campco. Uh, and had a wow. distribution company in town, Beckman Musical Instruments. So I ended up teaching the son of the owner of Campco for a period of time. And I got to know um, his parents. And one day he walks in and says, hey, I have the opportunity of becoming president of Roland US, which he was for over 20 years. And he said, I'm going to sell my distribution company and sell the Campco and the name Campco is, is interesting to the Japanese company Hoshino that is Tama drums, but they don't want any of the machinery and equipment. 
would you want the machinery and equipment? Because he knew I had some inventions uh, and he knew I wanted to stay in town. My son was born. I didn't want to travel. So uh, I immediately panicked and said, I guess because the pedal is the main thing that Camp Go had. And all of my friends and the guys in town, you know, it was the pedal to have. It was kind of the only pedal that really worked really well back in that particular time in history. So when that opportunity came up, then it was like, okay, let's jump into it and we'll start making bass drum pedals. And that's when John and I decided we would, you know, we had the little teaching studio going. We were trying to get into a little retail sales, which neither of us liked selling stuff. We liked making things. Um, so we decided, yeah, we'll do it. We'll take this. I borrowed money from, uh, I was working that evenings with a, in a quartet, Paul Real. We were at Sherry's on the strip and sunset, uh, Boulevard and, uh, and wow. I went to him and borrowed, we both went to the credit union. I borrowed, I tapped my credit union out for 10,000. He tapped his out for seven. I made the down payment on it to Tom Beckman, a longer story, but that's the long story short, which got us the rights to the dyes and mold. And then see if you remember John Good, uh, we needed more space because we needed to, you know, we were going to do the teaching. We wanted to have a retail store. We were going to start making stuff kind of in the back. So we had to move from the little nail salon to a bigger location. And yes, John, we did. And, and John, John went there. I had no idea he had these skills. He went there and got wood and faced the outside of it in this whatever kind of wood. It made it look just gorgeous. Built the studio on the inside. Uh, so we had a recording studio and everything was ready to go. And I signed the lease on the building. Everything. Was we were ready. so happy. We're, we're, this is going to work. We got a vision. You could reach out and touch it. Wow. And Don goes, man, this is it. We're, we're you know, well, we look at it. The big time. You know, we, had a, we, we spent all of our money on it at the end of the day. We had no money for inventory or anything. I, we didn't figure that out ahead of time. But, but this was going to be the – and it was on a corner across from the high school, right? It was on Glencoe and Venice. Wow. We were ready to move and we had to call the electrician in order to get the final approval. And they showed up with this huge truck. I mean, the huge Edison truck, you know, the, the massive one comes out. The zoom boom and all that. We had to turn on the electricity for us. Guys and hard hats. He's there for a while and he's, uh, we signed the lease. We gave $3,000 deposit to the realtor who was so happy to lease it to us. And the electrician is fooling around and he's on the phone forever and a pay phone. And I don't know what's taking him so much time. I said, how long does it take to turn it on? And he calls again. He says, you know, I got my supervisor coming out. Supervisor shows up and they said, you know, you can't operate a music store in this location. This is oh, a traditional no. use permit. You could have cleaners, you could have a donut shop, but you can't have a music store here. We so, wanted a hundred amp service. And he said, no way. You can't, you can't do that. So I, I called the realtor up. And I said, I expected this big diatribe about, oh, well, is they're wrong. We can get it. I said, you know, they came out here and the city says I can't put a business here under the non-conditional use permit that, that, is, that restricts the type of business. He says, oh, I didn't think anybody would, would find out. After we worked on it for like six months, I then sued the guy to get my $3,000 back, which he had to give us back. So, wow. And then the oh. camp thing came into fold and we moved into uh, a garage. I, I, another moved garage. into the garage, mm -hmm. and moved I felt homeless, totally homeless, and it was in Gardena. And you want to talk about the most depressing thing? I mean, Don was just doing whatever he could to keep us chugging along, but I, I'm, you know, I'm building seats because we still had to build some of those because we got an order for a hundred of them from wow. from Tom Beckman. <laughs> yeah. And, and Don and I said, we're rich. That's it. We, you know, we just hit the big time. Anyway. A hundred, a hundred a month, by the way. I forgot that until I just saw this order. Yeah, there's no way in hell we could do that. We never so, saw this order. So it's just anyway, the two of you building a hundred royal thrones. No, the two of us? Come on. It was him. It was John. Oh. <laughs> I was one of you. I want you to imagine the the depression. You're, 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 you're in a workbench in a garage and there's a Toyota parked behind you and and, and it's just like gosh I, is this what it feels like you know to actually make it and uh, and then you know Don was just like doing his best to try and figure out well, okay where do we go from here 
And that's where we met Ralph White. Yeah, and he was, he was making a, a component for us for the inside of the seat. And he was making the bracket for the inside of the seat. I found him. Which I drew. That was his first bracket. Yep, yep, right. Wow. And we found him in the Yellow Pages. The Yellow Pages, by the way, for all of you out there, was a book you would get. <laughs> yeah, about that thick. That was the way you would advertise your company. If somebody wanted to find out a plumber or something, they would go to the Yellow Pages part of the phone book. But that was the timing. This was uh, February 76 when we got this order. And then right after that, I had the opportunity to buy the tooling dies and molds when uh, Tom Beckman's son came in, and it was late 76, wow. early 77. Wow. And, wow. and we moved into a small, what would you call it? Uh, it was a small, it was a house that was on a lot in Gardena. It, it, it was in front of his, I don't think it was permitted at no, all. It wasn't legal for us to be there. Yeah, and, and there was, <laughs> and it was just like some old paneling and, um, you know, it had enough electricity for us to put some drill presses in and stuff. And we were, we were in production. Yeah. My, brother we dropped in off, my brother dropped off the drill press. He had a drill press in his garage. I said, we're going to make things. We need a drill press. And John's a very mechanical guy. So we dropped off the drill press and he left. And I said, okay, John, we're going to get going. He says, well, you know how to use this? I said, no. He said, no, I've never used a drill press either. <laughs> so we're not even thinking about possible injury here, right? No, no, that, that was long gone. No, we had a lathe and a drill press. So John was there wow. making every part that you could see that had to do with a pedal. He learned how to use a lathe, and, and we made them one at a time. For the so you made the what we now call the DW5000? Yeah, it was the 5000 uh, nylon strap at the beginning. Uh, and then we, you know, we got about, fortunately, many patents on upgrades to it with the chain sprocket, the, the plate underneath, and... We just upgraded it right away. And it's the pedal I use to this day, the, the 5,000. I love it. And we've continued to upgrade it through the years, right, John? Yep. Uh, oh, my God. Uh, there's so many variations of it now because of, you know, Don. Don's imagination for what if we do this, what if we do that, and then, um, you know, with, with the other elements of other talented people that have come our way, there's so many pedals now that some dealers were going, you guys have got too many pedals. So, uh, <laughs> so as we but, were developing the pedal, though, through the years, my number one tester out there on the road was John Good. Johnny Hernandez. No, <laughs> John Good. Tell him how that came about, John. That's you know, before we do that, before you tell us that, John, we're going to take a little pause for the cause because this is such a fascinating story. We're going to take a little break and we're going to come back with this story, John, because this we're going to find about fantastic. we're going to find out about the, the other lives of John Good. Yes. Oh, oh. We'll be right back. Hey, Chad Smith here. I'm at the Jump Channel. Huh. Hi, I'm Don Lombardi. About 40 years ago, I started DW Drums in my garage. During that whole period of time, I was lucky to get to know many of the greatest drummers and teachers of all time. Drum Channel is a unique opportunity for you to invest in your future, and we have made sure that it's worth it. Hey, it's Kirky B on DC, and we're back with the two pillars of drumming. Don Lombardi and John Good, and we left off with you, John, telling us a fantastic story about the DW5000 pedal. And there were times when Don said, you know what, this needs to be road tested, a lot of the things we were doing. And, and at this point, John, you were starting to become a drum tech, correct? Well, yeah, I mean, uh, and Don will tell the story better than I can about, uh, I got involved somehow with uh, Earth, Wind and Fire. Yeah. Wow. And uh, uh, Freddie White. And, and he had this, this, this drum kit from X brand that sounded like um, poo poo. And so I, I had a talent for, if, if there's any talents I actually have, for, for straightening out bearing edges. And um, I straightened them out, cut the edges. And Don said, and, and they said, and I went into the studio, they said, look, when you get these drums back to us, they really sound beautiful. And I said, well, thank you. And they said, and you have a talent for tuning. So I said, well, okay, can you work on the record? So I'm working on records. Remember the complex, Kirky? Yes. 
Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so. well, yeah well, I was, was with like George there. Massenberg and all these really cool guys that, you know, were incredible to this day. Anyway, then they finally said, hey, maybe we, you'd like to come on the road with us. And, and they said, look, man. I said, well, I've got some products and, and my partner, Don, we've got some things we'd like to really try. And, and we had all these, you know, well, we were innovative at the time. Uh, could you could you come out and we don't care, bring the pedals, whatever, bring, you know, and all that. And, uh, and you know, and, and we'll pay you $400 a week. So I, and, I, I got trumped because he was I, he was making seventy five dollars. Oh, <laughs> I was making seventy five bucks, and I just went screw down. No, I didn't do that. I, it was just like Don because he's like he's like my older brother. I said, "Are you okay with this?" And he says, "No, just go, go, go." But but I really want some feedback from the road. So you know, and they're free T-shirts. Come on. I mean, how could you turn that down? So, uh, <laughs> so we went out. It was like 1980, right, Tom? Yeah, pretty much. And uh, and this was in the heyday of Earth, Wind, and Fire. And and I'm oh, in wow. arenas, and I'm like, wow. But we had these pedals that you, I just, my whole focus was to watch those doggone things, because Don wasn't sure, and I wasn't sure exactly how things are going to hold up or perform. I mean, thank God we, we really did have some good confidence and some engineering behind it. Don, whether he thinks he is or not, is an incredible engineer. My father was a mechanical engineer and I refused to, to be like him right. who, who turned out to be the coolest guy. I think I'll ever know. But, um, but when that's in your blood, you know, as music is in yours, you can't shake it off. You can't get rid of it. And uh, so true. So we would sit out there, and and there were some failures, some catastrophic failures. But um, well, especially I think the biggest one. <laughs> I think the biggest one, Don, if you recall, was Jim Keltner. We <laughs> sent him out with the first double pedal, Jimmy, yeah. Lee. and it exploded. It just, he was in France or something. and uh, Which I sent it to him to try. I didn't anticipate he would, next thing it would be on a major tour. <laughs> it was Dylan, right? I think it was yeah. Bob Dylan. Wow. <laughs> Which, I don't imagine a lot of double bass drumming with Bob Dylan, but anyway, he was using it. But And, and I'll never forget, Don, sitting behind uh, Jim Keltner when he was working with Ringo, I, I, I love Jim Keltner, like, you know, Don't we so, so many people that, that we know, but this man is incredible. But I would sit behind him, I brought him a new, I don't know, floor tom or something. Oh, no, it was a floor tom leg thing, Don, that you, you devised. And I'm watching him play double pedal with a Ringo. And it's, you know, like most people who play boom. No, Jimmy Lee Keltner, you know, he's always eating chiclet or something out of a pocket somewhere, you know. While he's playing drums. <laughs> well, yeah. And, and and he would play the double pedal, boom, 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 boom. I thought that was the most lazy, but the coolest, slickest thing I've ever seen. You did a series of unbelievable tours with great drummers. You went on from there to what? Uh, Frank Zappa. Yeah. And that was Chad Wackerman. And that's back when we had the hitch pins, remember, in the... Yeah, in the double pedal. Yeah. And, um, man, we go out there and just play all these gigs. And this was scrutinizing as hell to have Frank Zappa, who, if there was a hair out of place with music, he'd spin around and look at you. And that guy has got an eyebrow. And when that kinks up and he's looking at you, it's ain't good. Um, wow. But you know what? Chad Wackerman, such an incredible talent. I mean, dear friend of all of ours. Yes. And one of the reasons why I came aboard on with Drum Workshop, he was one of the uh, – him and Jim Keltner were both responsible for me being a family member of DW. 
Well, you know, and, and thank God for, for that, because I remember the day I met you. Yes. That was several, several tours with Frank, right? A couple of tours. Yeah, did a couple of tours with Frank and, and, and the experimentation of everything. He was one of the first guys I, I went through, oddly enough, with a Slingerland drum kit that I fixed because the edges weren't so great. And we recorded absolutely everything. And Frank loved it. And he said, can we do this again and again? And he and I became friends. And um, those are a lot of other stories that I know we don't have time for. But I will tell you this much. The scrutiny of recording everything every night and the standard of excellence really brought my game to a place where I think Don and I, I mean, a light went on in my head. This industry deserves a standard of excellence, and, and we try to provide that. And through the years, Don kept innovating, innovating, innovating. And that's when I started to really understand the mechanics of what I wanted to build in drum, drum kits. And it's, they're springboards, and, and there's reasons why all these things happen. I swim in the shallow pool of the spiritual pool. I'm not really sure why, but they did happen. And, uh, and I'm proud to say it's, it's part of our um, American story, Don and I. Wow. Which so Harry went on to Michael Jackson, too. Talk about many tours with Michael. Oh, and yes, of course, MJ. Yeah, we did MJ, uh, the, one of the greatest, biggest tours. I, I'm not sure. That's with Sugar Food Moffat, correct? Yeah, and, and yep. Jonathan was playing. And get this, Jonathan, who's a great guy, he knocked on my door. I mean, I was living in that, remember that little place, Don, in Santa Monica? Sure. And uh, it was a one-bedroom apartment. And he knocked on the door, and he, and he brought in a, a big book of all his pictures playing with the Jackson family. And he auditioned himself to me, and I'm going, how in the hell do I have credentials? You're playing with Michael Jackson. Well, it turns out word gets around when you've worked with Frank Zappa and you go through that boot camp, you have credentials. If, if you get through it and, 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 you know, it's a value thing. That's the top of the list right there. It, it, very much so. And I miss him. I think about him every day, but I will tell you, uh, he auditioned himself to me, and, and so I said yes, and we went on the road, and, and those were great, big, big, huge tours. I mean, bigger than I had ever seen. Don, didn't you come out to one of them? Somewhere? Oh, yeah, I saw a couple of them, several several of them, yeah. Yeah, and, wow. and, and Don would go, well, it was some kind of expirulative I don't think we can use, but I'd go. It was like 20, tr heck? 20, 20 trucks or something. It was like unbelievable amount of It was singing. 30, 30 trucks. And 30 it was just for Jonathan's drums alone. Yeah. <laughs> I had to say that. My, Michael would say as he goes up up the stage, because you happen to be down where the drum behind the drum right went up. Say, good, good show, Mr. Good. What did he say something to you every time he went up? I forget. He, every time he went up, he shook my hand and he had that, uh, that glove on. Right. And he'd go, and I'd say, Michael, have a good show, okay? And he says, thank you very much, John. I appreciate everything. And, 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 and wow. we hit the switch and up he'd go, you know? And it was just like. Then you did Madonna. Even... Then you did Madonna with, uh, that, those were huge tours too. Those were some biggies too. And I'll never forget. I mean, it's not a show about me. This is more about Don, but. Um, it's the both of you. No. It's, it's <laughs> anyway. A, it's part of history. I mean, this is all ties into what we were able to do together because you were getting, I mean, talk about a wealth of knowledge. But it was it was OJT, Don, if you yeah, really think exactly. about it. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And, and Don would come up with say, let's, let's try this one. Let's do this. And I'd go out, and now we were actually eventually using DW drums, but for the most part, we were using Yamaha. Um, because that's what the artist was using. And, and I was doing outfitting the entire thing with stands and pedals and things that Don and I were working on. And um, they were very innovative. They are very innovative to this day. But I will say um, 
I'm on the road, and the sensation of Madonna was gigantic. I mean, I'll never forget the first night in Seattle, Washington, when that when the curtain opened up, and those kids screamed like the Beatles. I mean, it, it blew your ears out. Yeah, I, I went. This lady is going to be, and this is a woman I drove home, you know, from rehearsals at Leeds, you know. And, and she was so full of herself, she wouldn't say a word to me. It would drive me home, you know. Okay, so all right. Anyway, um, I, I will say that, that those things molded a big aspect of R and D, which Don and I were doing all the R and D at that time. And uh, we had some great people, and we still to this day, which is a testament to the tenacity of Don, especially for uh, all these employees that we still have that I, that I cherish. But I mean, it was like a, a, a period of time of uncertainty. And, and so I have kept having to go out on the road because we really didn't have much money. And, um, you know, and I was trying to buy a house and I was trying to do a few things anyway. Um, yeah, these tours were, the tours weren't one after the, I mean, there was breaks between the tours where you'd be back working together with us again for six, eight months, and then another tour, and then another six, eight. So we were able to keep the ball rolling. So it, yeah, sounds, like I, there's, it sounds like there was a lot of risk taken here. I mean, at this point in the game, you know, pre-DW drums, you know, both of you guys are really crafting at what you're both doing. And it just sounds like there's a lot of risk involved here. Well, we're up against the big giants of, of the world, you know, the, the, the Asian companies, you know, and they were, they were doing their thing. Ludwig was still doing his thing. And I believe Slingerland was still there. And, uh, this and, was during and, the 80s, pretty much. We're talking about during the age from 78, 79, up through wow. the 80s, you were doing the tour. And then you were about to go out again is when you called me and I just said, I need you here. No, I get this. I'm in Milwaukee. And I called in because I promised Don I would check in every couple days. And he'd go, where are you today? And I, you know, when you get on a road routine, you just kind of go, where am I today? And right. I happen to be in Milwaukee. And I called him up and I'll never forget this. And he goes, you know what? It's time for you to come home. And that's like a brother, right? And I'd listened to Don most of my life, and he was always right. right. And this time I said, boy, but Don, I, I'm, I'm making some good money here. So he says, just come home, let's talk about it. So there was a break coming up. So I came home, and then there was a Elton John thing that was going to happen. And I started working with Elton John, and jo Jonathan Moffat was was involved. Right. And I got to know all the cats, you know, David Johnstone's friend of yours, I'm sure. Yep. And, right and uh, all these guys. And and Elton said, "Look, because I said I, I really can't do this, Don. Don really would like for us." He says, "There's a period in time where we've got to make this happen, and now's right. the time." Strike when the iron is hot. And, and so Elton said, pay the guy a hundred grand to stay. Keep Jonathan happy. So I went, Don, <laughs> they're going to pay me a hundred grand. And Don goes, you know, I got 40 grand. that says you'll come home. Now wow. So there was wow. a, at that point in time, we had gotten, uh, enough drum sets out we weren't selling them as part of our business model we were in the business of making pedals and stands through the 80s All but right. during periods when john would be off we would always grab some shells we'd make a couple of kits a month or a kit every couple of months so over a period of six or seven years on and off we had made 30 or 40 kits so there was enough out there where we had to decide if we were going to be a hardware company making pedals at which point you're going to be that big or we were going to make the transition and become a full drum company that also makes hardware. Well, that was like going into business all over again. You might as well have been in the car business and decided to go into the, to the ranching business because 
the difference in price points between buying a, a pedal for a, those days, 129 bucks and a drum set for 2000, which was a, a crazy amount we had to charge because we were making it in America against all our competitors at that point. Yeah, our competitors at that point, keep in mind, were all making their product main competitors out of Taiwan, which was far under a dollar an hour labor. And wow. we were at eight or nine back in those days. So right. it's like, would somebody pay all this money to get a drum set of the quality that John Good would want to put his name behind and that the biggest drummers in the world could go out there and play? And you know, could we make a drum set where Frank would turn around and say, hey, that's what I, that's, yeah, that's what I want. That's, that's a great sounding drum set. So I just said, we have, I think there's an opportunity. There's some dealers calling. They would like to actually buy a drum set and put it in their shop rather than us selling to, to artists. We had quite a list of drummers, drummers uh, that were studio guys and, and pro players that weren't necessarily in the band, but they were, they were the, the drummer, you know, the hired drummer in the band. If you, uh, if you could give all of us just who were the top first five drum workshop drum users? Well, depends on how far, far back you go. My teacher, Nick Ciroli, of course, as soon as I, the moment that Tom Beckman walked in and said, do you want to buy the tooling dies and molds? I immediately called him. And he actually was playing a Campco drum set at, at that time. He had switched from Slingerland to Campco. So he was well aware of the product. And he, he and Remo Belli both encouraged me to go ahead and, and buy the tooling dies and molds and get into it. So Nick would have been one of our, one of our first but as the years went through the 80s, the first major drummer who was with a major band um, and selling records was Danny Seraphine. When he switched over, the drummer, then, you know, Chicago's drummer plays uh, DW drums. That was a big push for us. And then a couple of years after him, which is when I called John, was Tommy Lee. And that's another wow. whole show. But when Tommy decided to play DW drums, that took that was us big. And that's when I said to John, you know, we, this, we, I think we can, we got to give it a shot. And we went to the damn show right. at, at, uh, I was either going to buy a band because <laughs> my white band was shot, or we were going to put $30,000 into a catalog and go into the NAM show. And that's when, you know, we have a whole NAM show story that's good for another show. But yeah, sure. Something that allows us to do what we're doing in these days over the, over the last, you know, 10 or more years is the fact that Chris has taken over the reins of, when a company gets to a certain size, it's it's a, a double full time job to 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 run it as a business to see all the, the things we did at the very beginning. You know, you've got to make enough stuff. You got to look at the rent. You got to see what your sales are. You got to do your marketing. There's like, you know, this we Many did it parts. with three or four people back in the day, and you know, you need somebody who focuses just on that so that we can do what we enjoy doing and really what got us here. And that's kind of, I think, been the key of our success in recent 15 or 20 years is that, you know, we've been able to, you know, been fortunate where Chris has, you know, really grown into more than just running the company to really being a, a leader in the industry uh, so we can continue to do what we're doing. That's, that's a blessing unto itself. And we have our 50th anniversary around the corner. Oh, okay. Wow. <laughs> I'll, I'll salute to that. That's right. Coming up next year. There it is. Wow. I can't wait for that. We got some you know surprises. What? This is the perfect time to end this interview because we could go all day long for weeks, if not months, but we're going to stop it right here. Speaking of that, uh, one of the surprises I've got is uh, we're going to have a Don and John show once a month uh, that'll be on Drum Channel and we'll let people know when it is live. Thank you, Kirky, for having us. Oh, up. thank you, guys. Thank you both, you guys. Thank you. We'll, we'll see you next time. Yes. John, I'll see you soon. All right. See you soon, Don. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Stand by, stand by.